I'm Dr. Jennifer Morse. I'm the medical director for District Health Department number 10, Mid-Michigan District Health Department and Central Michigan District Health Department. I'm here today to talk about mRNA vaccines and if they're safe, how we know they're safe, and just a little bit more about them. So first of all, what is mRNA? And to understand that, we just need to go a little bit over um, biology and back to our biology classes from when we were kids. So just as a refresher, we have our cells, we have our nucleus, and inside our nucleus is our DNA. This is not drawn to scale, it's much smaller than that. We also have DNA in our mitochondria. Um, it's just a little bit, it stays there. We don't, we're not really gonna talk about that, but I just wanted to point that out for those of you who might say, hey, wait a minute, it's not just in our nucleus. So our DNA has our blueprint, our instructions that tell us how to do everything in our body. So within that nucleus, um, we have our DNA. It'll unzip and we'll make a copy of that. It's not an exact replica, but it has the same message and that's called RNA. Uh, when it leaves, when it's specific for leaving our nucleus to take a message outside, it's called mRNA and it has specific tags on it for that. It is pushed out through channels out of our nucleus. So there is no way that this message can get back inside this, the nucleus. So it's a one-way passage outside. It also cannot get into our mitochondria. So once this mRNA is out into our cell, we'll pretend like this is our cell here, um, there's liquid out here called cytosol. Our mRNA is out here. Um, little guys called ribosomes hook up to the mRNA and read it. They kind of zip right along this and read it. And they read the code on the mRNA and they read what amino acids or building blocks of proteins. They'll say, okay, you go there and you go there and you go there. And it reads the code and then builds a protein based on this code. Um, once that's done, the mRNA gets broken down within a few days. It's all done. We don't need it anymore. It just goes away when we need more of this protein. Um, the DNA will unzip and make more. So again, the DNA makes um, a copy of the message into mRNA. It pushes it out of the nucleus. Um, it's made into a protein. It cannot, the protein cannot go back into mRNA. The mRNA cannot go back into the nucleus. It cannot go back into your DNA. So it's all a one-way passage. So as an illustration here, again, this is all a one-way trip. A way to think of this is if you had your blueprint to build your house, that would be your DNA. Let's say you need to get something to build your kitchen cabinets. So you would write the list of tools you needed to build your kitchen cabinets. Those instructions would be your mRNA. Then you would go to the store that has the tools that you would need. Those are your ribosomes. So that's what would then go off of your list to get the tool. And then the tools themselves would be the protein that the ribosome makes. So let's say the code that you need made is your insulin. So your blueprint, your DNA would make instructions for how to make insulin. Then you would go to the store and get something that would then make the insulin for you. It would read off the directions and make the tool, which is insulin. So you can see that you can't go backwards. You can't go from here or from here and make this blueprint. So again, if we use an mRNA vaccine, it cannot change the blueprint. It cannot change or integrate into or make any differences to your DNA. 
So it's just biologically impossible for that to happen. So that it's really difficult to explain that quickly, but just so you know that fundamentals of biology, mRNA vaccines cannot change your DNA. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are available right now are both mRNA vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine was made in partnership with a German company named BioNTech. Pfizer actually one of the manufacturing plants are in, is in Port, Michigan. So that's a, a fun fact that we're making this vaccine right here in Michigan. Moderna company um, is a smaller company that's based in Massachusetts and has been working on mRNA vaccines for quite some time. They both have an mRNA code that programs for the spike protein. The spike protein is this green guy on the outside of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the key that goes into the lock on our cells and gets the virus access into our cells to infect us and cause illness. So the mRNA that's injected in that vaccine programs for just this one protein so that we then create a defense against this one protein. So if we get sick with this virus, our body attacks that key so it cannot unlock our cells and cause infection. So what they did then is they took that mRNA and mixed it up with specific kinds of fats to make these little fatty oily packages that are called lipid nanoparticles, um, which is just kind of a fancy term for little fatty packages, tiny, tiny nanoparticles, so teeny tiny. These kinds of packagings of medication have been used for decades and they've been used to help give injections that can last for a long time. They've been used for cancer medicines, um, they've been used and studied a lot for um, really cutting edge treatments for genetic illnesses. So these are not a new technology. Um, the vaccine, once it's injected into our muscle in our arm, our white blood cells, dendritic cells, which are another really important cell in our immune system, gobble up these little nanoparticles. Then our body, within that cell then that mRNA is released then this ribosome again reads that mRNA, makes the protein for the spike protein. Then that white blood cell, which is part of our immune system, presents that antibody, or I'm sorry, presents that antigen or that protein to the rest of our immune system. Our immune system says, hey, that does not belong to us. We don't like that. Our body then creates antibodies or other things for our immune system to attack it. And then our body remembers that so that if we encounter it again, when or if we are infected with SARS in the future, we're rearing and ready to go to fight it off in the future. So big question, are mRNA vaccines safe? So these actually have been studied since, the, since 1990. They've been studied for three decades now. Um, for many different infections, uh, they just haven't always produced the best immune response. There are some now in phase three studies for flu. So these really have been studied a long time and they have found them to be very safe and they don't change our DNA. They have perfected ways to really create quick vaccines as we found with this illness. They cannot cause infection because it's not a whole virus. It's just a teeny tiny piece of a virus. And they found that these vaccines typically do cause a strong immune reaction um, for the most part. Again, sometimes not so much. And so those vaccines have not gone on to further studies. Um, they don't need a cell culture. So a lot of vaccines use a whole virus. So you have to grow those in something. So they may grow them in eggs. They may grow them in human tissue or animal tissue. Uh, so these do not need any kind of a tissue to grow the virus in. So we don't have to worry about allergies or any other concerns like that. Some concerns are that this does cause a good immune response. Well, for some people that causes a feeling like your immune system is responding. So you might feel achy or feverish. 
um, have a headache, you might have a sore arm, uh, more than you might for some other vaccines. For many people, it really is not a big deal. For some, you might feel kind of crummy for a day or two, like you're fighting off a cold or a flu. You can have allergic reactions just like you could with any other medication. And since these are brand new, people haven't had them before. So it's just something new we have to watch for. Um, the other concern, this does attack a protein on a virus that is coded for by the RNA. And if the RNA changes or mutates, will the vaccine still work? And so that's another concern right now. So with the allergic reaction concern, a study just came out um, just a week ago um, that looked at the Pfizer vaccine. And from December 14th to the 23rd, there were one almost 1.9 million doses given in the US. They were first time doses. And out of those doses, there were 21 cases of anaphylaxis, which is the most severe allergic reaction you could have. Um, so that's a rate of 0.0001%, or about 11 cases in every million doses. So there, of the 21 people that had reactions, um, only four of those people had no history of any kind of allergic reaction before. Um, of the 21 people, a third of them had had an anaphylactic reaction before. 71% um, of them had the reaction within 15 minutes. And um, the remaining people, three of them had the reaction within 30 minutes and three had a longer delayed reaction. Only four people had to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, the rest went to the emergency room and then were sent home. Um, when this paper was published, um, it went to publication on January 6th. And again, the study was from the 14th to the 23rd. All of the individuals were at home or and or recovered um, when the paper was published. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Pause this if you want to see more information. Um, but this lists their ages, their gender, what other types of allergies or reactions they've had in the past, if they have a history of anaphylaxis, how long the reactions took, um, what type of reaction they had, where they were treated, and then their disposition. So if you want to see further information, you can pause this video right now to read this. This comes from a report in the CDC. So again, with any new type of medication, um, even though many of the ingredients in these vaccines have been used before, um, once you're giving something to millions of people, you expect to see some allergic reactions. Um, but given how many vaccines have been given, um, this really is not an exuberant amount, and everyone was um, easily treated and sent home. So what if the virus changes? The SARS-CoV-2 virus does evolve and change just like every other virus does, especially RNA viruses. But most of the changes don't really affect how the virus functions. Um, sometimes they tend to spread a little faster or infect people more easily. Um, we do routine sampling and testing of the genetics of the virus all over the world to help detect these changes. And if the virus is behaving differently, there is more testing done. In the United States alone, there are five different initiatives um, just set up solely to watch for changes in the genetics of the virus. And of interest in Michigan alone, uh, we have different labs that are testing 6% of all the different strains in the, in the United States. So Michigan has some good lab testing going on. So sometimes there are changes in the virus that are much bigger and the changes in the virus are called a variant. So the, the new virus is called a variant and usually those are given some kind of a name. So the different variants that we've seen, there was one called Cluster 5 that was found in Denmark in August, September time last year. And it was, main, it was found mainly in farmed mink and they had to actually euthanize quite a, a large number of mink. There were very few cases found in humans. So it was not really found to be a big risk in humans. More recently, there's one called SARS-CoV-2 B117, which was identified in Southern United Kingdom. 
and has since been found in at least 31 other countries. It does seem to spread more easily. Um, it may be binding better to our cells, but it doesn't seem more severe. And there were quite a few changes in the spike protein, but really it's a very small proportion of the spike protein. And so it does not, it is not felt that it's going to impact how well the vaccine works, but there are actual studies going on right now to be sure of that. There's a third one that was found more recently called SARS-CoV-2-B1351, which was found in South Africa in November and has been found since in four other countries. It also seems like it might spread more easily, but so far it doesn't look like it's any more severe. And similar to B117, um, does not seem like it will affect vaccine effectiveness. Um, the reason why is again, the mRNA vaccines encode for the entire spike protein. So when our immune system will attack that and make antibodies to it, it's doing that to multiple different locations on that spike protein. So there's hundreds and thousands of different spots. If 20 spots change in mutation, you could still have hundreds of other spots that you're your body has created the antibodies against. So it would take really, really huge and different mutations to affect that vaccine. Um, but rest assured, they are continuing to watch that so that if there's any mutations, they will watch to see if it's gonna affect the vaccine. So as a reminder, as you're getting vaccinated, um, the vaccines are still just one of our tools to help control the pandemic. Um, once you're vaccinated, you do still need to wear masks. You do still need to be cognizant of spatial distancing and gatherings. Once we have enough people vaccinated, once we know how well vaccines work on a large scale, hopefully we can start to back away from some of those things. But for now, everything stays the same. If you've been exposed, you need to quarantine. If you have symptoms, you need to stay home and get tested. Um, so everything stays the same for now. So please just remember that. So for information about vaccine availability, depending on your category and when it's time for you to get vaccinated, again, you can pause this slide if you need to. Um, I have information here depending on what county you live in. And for more information, you can visit the CDC or Michigan.gov. I really appreciate your time. Uh, please get vaccinated and encourage those around you to do so as well. Thank you.